Welcome to the e-commerce growth show brought to you by Segmentify, the fast, lean learning machine, the fastest learning, most revenue generating personalization platform for e-commerce. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the what is actually the last episode of the second series of the e-commerce growth show. Um, I'll be honest, it's been absolutely phenomenal. I've loved every minute of it. I think we've done 25 episodes now. Um, and I've got an absolute corker for you coming up uh, in this one. And uh, But just to give you a few uh, kind of notes on how we've uh, helped people and what we've done so far in the series, it's been just so, I've been so blessed to be part of it, really. Um, as I said, we've done 25 episodes. This whole, ep- this whole series has been all about supporting people that have gone out of work or have had work dried up during the COVID season and lockdown. Um, and uh, we've got some brilliant uh, success stories, uh, to name a few. I think we've got Simon Homant, um, you know, on his journey, ended up uh, at Game, uh, which is a, a fantastic position. And obviously, I can't take credit for that, but, you know, it was fantastic to be part of that journey um, to, to know where he ended up. Um, we planted about 25, 30 trees in the Segmentify Forest as a big thank you to all the uh, podcast thought leaders. Um, so we're doing our bit for the environment together. And uh, and basically, we're going to cap it off in a second. I'll let you know who I'm talking to. But he's a phenomenal guy. Um, I, I'm just blown away by, 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 by what we've talked about so far. But just to let you know, you know, the, the, the e-commerce growth show isn't going anywhere. Um, we're just purely bringing out a new series, um, the Series 3, which is all about um, customer best practice. So we're going to double down on a, uh, a select few of our customers that have done some pretty deep, and complex uh, best practice type uh, adoption of Segmentify and really just go into a little bit more detail so that people are understanding how they're pushing the boundaries or how they can push the boundaries of uh, personalization um, for their businesses going forward. Um, so as you know, this, this podcast channel is all about bringing that thought leadership in all these kind of areas, whether it's personal um, or business to, to our e-commerce community. And as I said uh, at the beginning, I've got a phenomenal guy uh, I, I can introduce to you now, coming from uh, Salt Lake City, of all places, 746 or 758 now, nearly eight o'clock uh, in Salt Lake City. And uh, this, is a, this is a man called Henry Das. And Henry is a 30-year serial entrepreneur. So I am absolutely, uh, I'm so excited to, to, to have a chat. And uh, he is a very experienced business coach. And uh, what he's been doing for, for a lot of his career is coaching business leaders of any business, actually. So it's not confined to, to e-commerce. It's, uh, it's any business uh, uh, are doing more than a million uh, or dollars in, in turnover or revenue. Uh, and also, more recently, um, some startups as well. Um, and, uh, and on top of that, uh, he's written a book on uh, FQ, so think IQ, EQ, but this is FQ, financial intelligence, love it. And that's all about managing your wealth, uh, wherever you may be with that situation and for your whole life. And um, I, I hear there's about five trademarks on it, but uh, let's, let's give it to Henry because uh, this is the true financial intelligence guru, I reckon. Um, so yeah, hello, Henry. It's so great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Phil. Great to be here in, in cloudy Salt Lake City, which is not my home. Just it's where my son goes to college, just just for clarity's sake. Yeah, no, completely. And you were like traveling for 22 hours, right? 35 hour drive 35. From, from New Jersey, Twenty two over 2,200 wow. miles in three, yeah, yeah. three and a half days. So That is unbelievable. That's, yeah. that's, that's some far cry from the UK, right? Where you go from top to tail in eight hours or something. Yeah, exactly. Unbelievable. <laughs> yeah, we saw we saw at least eight hours of cornfields. So probably more. <laughs> wow, yeah, <laughs> so, unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, so what? Why don't we start with a bit of an icebreaker? Um, okay. One of, one of the things you mentioned earlier was that you're a bit of a writer, um, and that you've written eleven screenplays. I that, have. That's, some, that's yeah. some feat. I mean, tell tell us all about it. So. Um... You know, I, I've discovered in my 61 years on this planet that I've always performed best 
when I have a right brain exercise as sort yes. of a yin and a yang, right? Yep, yep. So anytime Absolutely. that I've gotten out of balance, either too much business or too much play, mm-hmm. um, you know, bad things happen. So yeah. um, I always wanted to be a writer when I was young. <clears throat> it was never nurtured by my parents. My parents were depression babies and yeah, yeah. they're like, you know, I studied electrical engineering. That's what I went to college for. I was good at math. Yeah. I did all that stuff, but I really wanted to study poli sci and write books, but it's like, nah, nah, you'll never make a living that way. So that was drilled yeah. into me at an early age, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, but now my parents are gone. So <laughs> I oh, miss, yeah. I miss exactly. them dearly. Course. But I don't have to prove anything to them anymore. So uh, in my in my uh, my uh, late middle age or middle middle age, um, I can kind of do what I want. And so I write. I write a couple blogs. I wrote this book, and I write screenplays as a, as um, you know really for fun. Yeah. I tried to market yeah. them. Hollywood is a nest of vipers. I don't want to go there. Although I've I've had very professional people read my work and I've had a few people very high up say, you know, your work is exceptional, but you know, I got nothing for you. I can't do anything yeah, yeah, to yeah. make your dreams a reality. If I ever get any of these made, it'll be because I did it. Um, I'm sort of, re- I'm sort of resigned to that fact, but there's yeah. a lot of, there's a lot of uh, sort of cross pollination between mm-hmm. creative writing mm-hmm. and business. And I'll, and I'll give you, yeah. I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I run a, I run a um, investment mastermind with a mm-hmm. bunch of folks um, and everybody has a different, you know, bend on what they want to invest in. Some want to invest in stocks. Some want to do yeah. crypto lending. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the people who was in, uh, who's in this particular group um, yeah. wants to buy and sell e-commerce sites, right? She wants to, she wants to buy and sell um, websites. Uh-huh. Buy them, gussy them up, and then, you know, and then flip them. But she wants to raise a fund to do it. Right. So I said, okay, put a deck together. Mm-hmm. And then at the last call that we have, we have calls every other week. And mm-hmm. so she presented the deck to us. And I said, listen, I'm going to remind you of something. A deck, and I've critiqued many a deck and reviewed many a mm-hmm. deck for yeah. clients and other friends. Mm-hmm. It's a movie, right? You're telling a story. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So don't leave the audience in suspense at the mm-hmm. beginning as to what genre it is. Like, you mm-hmm. need to know, is it a horror movie? You need to know within like 30 seconds, what yeah. am I in for with this movie? Yeah. Um, so when you're doing a deck for, for, um, for people, I remember somebody presenting me a deck years ago. It took me 10 minutes before I could figure out what their business was. Mm-hmm. That you can't, that's a kiss of death. They need yeah, to know. Yeah. What problem are you solving? What is your mm-hmm. business? Why am I going to open my checkbook to you? Yeah. And they need to know that now. So mm-hmm. tell it like a three act story. There's yeah. a setup. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle. And then yeah. there's the third act, which is the, what, what people would call the call to action. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's, um, that there's a, a lot to be learned by Absolutely. writing these types of things and mm-hmm. then applying them in other arenas. Yeah. No, I, I really look forward to um, one day, you know, because you're a serial entrepreneur, right, Henry? You know, yeah. you're going to uh, release one of these uh, screenplays and it's going to go global. And then, um, yeah, we, we all be very glad that we knew you. <laughs> I actually I actually have them posted on, a, on a, one of my yeah. personal websites. You can read the first 10 Brilliant. pages. And I'm it's starting easy, to put, right? yeah, just a little, well, you know, most people in Hollywood will tell you that I can know by the first page, whether the screenplay is any good. Yeah. Uh, I'm like, yeah. yeah, okay, great. You're wonderful. But yeah. mm, you know, sometimes there's good stuff that's not on page one it may take a little time to get there. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, that's the whole point. It's like, I mean, it's interesting you talk about it. it's right brain activity. You were saying, right? Right, right brain would be the creative yeah. side yeah. and then left that's brain right. being the sort of, you know, yeah. number crunching and the other stuff. Yeah. So you need Absolutely. to nurture both sides of your brain. Absolutely. And stay Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. And uh, my right brain activity that balances the number crunching, as you say, mm-hmm. is music, music yeah. production. So I, I've been a fan of electronic music production for, uh, what am I, 46? So good 20 years more, yeah. actually. 
And I, I actually grew up uh, and, and really fell in love with electronic music through Massive Attack, particularly in Bristol, because I'm a Bristol boy myself in the southwest of the UK. Okay. And uh, Massive Attack were a groundbreaking um, outfit that still are, actually. I still, I still believe their music is, is timeless, effectively. Um, but uh, I was absolutely um, gobsmacked at the kind of the level of depth of kind of complexity and attention to detail. Um, in the production of a particular guy called Neil Davidge. And um, he was a producer behind one of their albums called Mezzanine. And uh, it, it, it still blows me away now when I listen to it. And in a way, there is, it, it, there's a value system element there that says when you write music like that, you know, the values you have to write music like that, or probably a screenplay as good as you write, um, is very, very similar in, in terms of the values of how you go about doing business. But you're using that other side of your brain. And, it, and it's incredible how it kind of lifts the pressure off from the business side, you know, tr the true business side, like all the, like you say, all the analytical side of it and uh, provides a wonderful, like you say, balance between the two, which is so important. Yeah. There, there are analogs in, in, in writing a screenplay or, or, or music. I love music. I, mm. I consider myself a aficionado. I have no musical talent. I mean, I don't play an instrument <laughs> or anything like that, Yeah, uh, yeah. but I'm constantly, constantly, listening to music. I was watching in my hotel room last night because I had nothing to do. I was watching a documentary yeah. on George Martin, right? Oh, yeah. And all of the things that went on, it was fascinating. There's a structure to it. You know, a mm. screenplay has a three act structure. A, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, a pop song has a structure, the sort of A, B, mm. A, B, and then there's middle yeah, eight bars right. and there's yeah. a chorus yeah. and then there's yeah. A, B, A, B. And yeah. it's easy to define and, and having those those guardrails, those boundaries is yeah. great having the structure, but inside that structure, it, yeah. anything goes, That's you can right. do whatever you want. Business is yeah. exactly the same way. There's structure, yeah. there's AR, there's AP, there's finance, mm -hmm. there's human resources, there's yeah. all this stuff. But yeah. within that, you can have at it. Right? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. That is brilliant. I could talk to you about that all day anyway, but <laughs> <laughs> another time. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so, so let me introduce the the, the, the topic to, to the listeners. This is um, a very interesting topic, Henry, and I'm mm -hmm. actually super excited to talk about this with you, especially as the kind of capping off of the second series. And I have mentioned it a couple of times on other chats, but it, it has been a bit of a to do, but we're kind of opening it up today, um, which I think is brilliant. And so, guys, what we're talking about today is... Yes, business challenges related to COVID, obviously, it's a massive issue. But in particular, we are going to open the bonnet on Apple and all the Apples and the Amazons of this world, the big monoliths, and how to actually deal with them. And now I think that is a massive area to talk about, because I think it is the elephant in the room in many, many, many ways. And also people are often fearful of kind of almost going there. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to open it up. And actually, Henry mentioned a particular situation, which which I only read recently because I think it might be Henry as well, but we're, we're both into trades, you know, share, stocks and shares and stuff. And obviously, I'm a bit of a fledgling really compared to the uh, to Henry. But we both read obviously about Fortnite and Apple and uh, the problem with Apple basically trying to ban them um, because of the way I think it was to do with payments and stuff within the platform. And you probably know more about than I do. But Thing, so, so this is this is the kind of topic we're going to chat about. So, Henry, why don't you dive into that um, for the guys? Yeah, I think it's a it's a um, it's one of these topics that everybody's aware of, but they are fearful, right? Just but just think about that. Where is that fear based? That fear is based in the fact that these companies have become so gigantic, so mm -hmm. monolithic, so Mm -hmm. impenetrable and to a large degree unregulated right there were just recently congressional hearings here in the u.s they had bezos they had tim yeah. cook they had all these people um and even they were a little bit deferential to these guys understanding that yeah. they control huge amounts of money and let's face it here in the u.s if you want to get elected it takes huge amounts of money you do yeah. not want to bite the proverbial hand that feeds you. So they're in a very delicate situation. So the Apple situation with Fortnite, yeah, you, you hit on it. It's about money. 
Right. But ultimately, it's yeah. about it's about yeah. money. Yeah. Um, back in April, Amazon, um, April 21st, as it turns out, Amazon yeah. uh, instituted changes to their affiliate program, basically, yeah. you know, cutting the dollars in half. Yeah. Right. In the yeah. middle of the covid crisis. Right. Yeah. And why did they do this? Well, because they could. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're reading a story about diapers.com, right? Amazon drove them out of business. They were selling diapers at uh, a low cost, right? Yeah. How yeah. many companies can do that? A handful mm -hmm. of them. Mm -hmm. That's monopolistic power. Absolutely. Right, that they have. So if you are living in their ecosystem, as I often say, if you're playing in their sandbox, that's yeah. fine. But understand something. It's their sandbox. They can yeah. kick sand in your face. They can yeah. do worse than that. They can kick you out of the sandbox and you have very little recourse, if any. Right? Yeah. So COVID or no COVID, you mm -hmm. have to understand as a business owner where the risk is, right? We're yeah. talking about we're talking about finance. And we before this call, we were talking about trading and the markets and all of that stuff. Yeah. And in my book, I talked about how, you know, risk is the number one thing that you have to be able to assess. Mm -hmm. Anybody can quote you the return on investment. Oh, I made 15% on this stock. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. What was the risk associated with that? Well, what do you mean? I yeah. mean, to make that 15%, yeah. how risky was it? Yeah. If it was yeah. 10 times as risky as a, as a trade that I did that made yeah. 5%, yeah. You tell me, you, you, you do the arithmetic on that and you tell me yeah. which was a better trade. Yeah, because of the risk that you could have lost a lot more it's, than you got. Right? You could have lost it and you could have yeah. lost it like quickly, yeah. overnight. Yeah. When, when COVID started, I opened my business practice up for, for three months. April, May and June, I opened my yeah. business practice up for free. Yeah. And I spoke to over 50 people. I had 87 mm -hmm. uh, half hour plus phone calls with with over 50 different business owners. Some I had multiple phone calls with. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was very reminiscent of the stock market because there were people who were saying, you know what, I had a, I had a wonderful mm. travel blog and it was paying the bills. And overnight, it went to zero. All right. It fell off a cliff, just like the stock market fell off yeah. a cliff. And I heard yeah. multiple stories about this. Now, could they have done anything differently to to mitigate that risk, difficult to say without really doing a deep dive into yeah. all of the business decisions that they made. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but they were, to a large degree, blindsided. Now, yeah. in their defense, the yeah. COVID thing was a black swan event, if there ever was. One. Yeah, yeah. So completely. Um, completely. We had a, we had a little bit of notice, but even yeah. I didn't take it seriously back in in no. February. In, no. and um no. in january and february yeah um, yeah yeah it was a tricky one because i i was sat in a hotel room watching bloomberg actually and I, I i i'm part of a you know a traders forum in the uk and it's been very useful actually for me to learn quite a lot um you know of, of the ropes and one guy actually he he uh, he wrote a par like a parable like an analogy of thin ice and he said mm -hmm. basically you know he told a story effectively where there was a lot of people on the ice and um, cracks were starting to appear, but people thought that nah, it'll be all right. And they stayed on the ice and a few people got off, but a lot of people stayed on and eventually, you know, it cracked yeah. and a lot of people got burnt and then new ice started to appear. And of course, this is the whole analogy around the, the V effectively. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I literally, I was, I was fortunate in the sense that I, I watched that Bloomberg that morning and I started seeing the leisure sector tank. And I thought, I had a few bits and pieces going on in that sector, you know, nothing heavy, but a little bit. And I thought, you know what, that's looking intense. And, uh, and I got off then, but that was the very beginning, actually. So I was quite fortunate. And then obviously it then went completely mad for, for a time. But like you say, I mean, we're, like we were saying earlier, it's pretty much back to where it was. For the well, well. Yeah, it is. It's funny that that week, yeah. uh, March March seventh, we flew to Park City, Utah, 
Yeah. Because that's where, you know, my son goes to school here in Salt Lake City, and we all as a family went went skiing. And that Monday morning, the futures, yeah. which is the which is the last thing I look at yeah. when I go to bed and the first thing yeah. I look at when I wake up, they went limit down. And I'm like, really? oh man, this Whoa. is ugly. Yeah. And it's like, wow, this is really ugly. This is gonna be a bad day. Hey, let's go skiing. Um, <laughs> and, and that was kind of what we did all week. Yeah. I'm watching the market. I'm, yeah. I'm losing, I'm losing money now Yeah, because I'm, 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 I'm backstopped, you know, to a large degree. I understand. I've seen black swan yeah. events crash at yeah. 87, the dot yeah, bomb, yeah. but yeah. even I, I was nervous that week, but I said, Hey, we're going to yeah. ski. Let's go. Yeah. Let's, let's enjoy this. We're not going to let this ruin our life. We're not no. going to be broke. Um, no. And now here we are five months later, and mm-hmm. my portfolio has more than completely recovered yeah. for reasons yeah. that we talked about that I don't quite understand. As someone <laughs> who's been doing this since I was 17 years old, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I don't understand it. But again, yeah. so yeah. Yeah. circling back to the, uh, to the, to the, the, yeah, the, sure. the thread here, which yeah. is, you know, the, the, another story that I, that I mm-hmm. shared with you is a yeah. friend of mine who runs a seven figure e-commerce business mm-hmm. in a, you know, in a space that has to do with, um, you know, cameras and surveillance equipment. Well, recently Google said, um, you know, all the companies that are in this space mm-hmm. are now cons- are now sort of blacklisted and yeah. you won't be able to do PPC anymore. Well, 80% of his business comes from, yeah. from Google's PPC. Yeah. So now you've got to undertake the legal process of trying to deal with Google and say, hey, yeah. we're, you're, you're throwing out the babies with the bathwater. That is not what we do. You know, mm-hmm. we get that you're trying to to yeah. to um, to take out um, uh, illegitimate or predatory businesses in this space. But yeah. that's not us. No. Um you want to fight that battle? I mean, anybody who's ever been banned by Amazon, I had a client yeah. a number of years ago who was, yeah. um, you know, an FBA um, reseller. And he did 80% of his business between Thanksgiving and Christmas, you know, it was that yeah. that kind of a company. Yeah. And he, one of his competitors managed to, to get him banned from <laughs> Amazon right yeah. there two days before Black Friday. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You want to deal with Amazon's legal department? It's pretty in, impenetrable uh, at that point. Everything's oh, done via email. Oh, completely. Yeah, um, you've got no chance, right? You've got no these chance. These are massive risks that you want yeah. to take in this space. Absolutely. I, I, this is very interesting. So I, I <clears throat> completely understand the idea of the risk-reward side from, as you were saying, the trading side. Clearly, in terms of business, in terms of the sort of things you've been talking about, particularly our audience as well, being in, in e-commerce, do you have any thoughts around, obviously you've given some pretty clear examples there around the risk that you have if all of your business is going through Google paid media and suddenly you get banned or something like that. Are there any other thoughts that you've got in terms of minimizing that risk reward or balancing it almost like a portfolio as an e-commerce retailer or merchant brand well, well, yeah. There, there's, there's a, a lot to unpack in there. Uh, yeah. Probably the number one thing, I mean, the number one complaint that I've heard, and I've coached a lot of remote businesses and online businesses and such, yeah. is there's a certain, there's a certain opacity in playing in these, in these other sandboxes. Meaning, um, let's, uh, I'll use a different example. I'll use Udemy as an example because I know folks who are course creators. Um, yeah. And there, there's a level of indirection with their audience. So, you know, you want someone's email address so you can send them yeah. stuff. Yeah. And you want to have a Shopify site or whatever sort of site so they can buy directly for you. Sort of the proverbial cut out the middleman, right? Yeah. So yeah. if Amazon or Udemy or Apple or any of these entities act as this or Facebook or whatever it is, they're mm-hmm. acting as a gigantic middleman, right? Mm-hmm. But they own the marketplace. Yeah. You are now arm's length from your customers. So even though you've got a sale, mm-hmm. you don't have any real traceability as to who exactly I was selling my product to. You're grateful for the sale and that they open up a gigantic marketplace to you. However, you really can't capitalize mm-hmm. on that. No. You have no way to directly market to them. 
So yeah. one of the things that you really have to be mindful of and think about is what can I do in my business to expand my organic reach so that I can get to people and get them to maybe they made their initial purchase from Amazon, but figure out a way to get them to now purchase henceforth directly from me. And it's not just so you can make the other you know 10% that you're mm -hmm. paying for Amazon, but it's that you can ensure that you have yeah. a, a direct path because let's face yeah. it, it's yeah. orders of magnitude easier to sell more stuff to people you've already sold to than yeah. it is to sell that first thing to yeah. that brand new client. I think everybody yeah. realizes that. Yeah, so. yeah. I mean, I, I um, remember, I don't know whether this is still possible. I don't know if you know, but I remember getting stuff from Amazon and then in the box, there was a kind of a brochure or a pamphlet of information about the brand, the brand's website. And and I mm -hmm. think it was like a discount voucher thing as well. It said, hey, you know, come to the website, www. whatever it was, I can't remember now, um, and use this discount code. I wonder if has Amazon been able to stop that so that, of course, they can try and capitalize on information and trying to get people post purchase, if you like, in that way. Yeah. I mean, Amazon has has realized that they have enormous market clout, right? The mm. idea that, uh, you know, that the article we were talking about where Amazon, uh, you know, they have an invest, they have a, a VC fund, which yeah. obviously has very deep pockets. Yeah. Uh, they've invested in lots of little startup brands and such. And then, you know, I hate to say this, but they've essentially brain raped them. And then yeah. two years later, they come up with their own competing product. That is a clone of a product that they already invested in. Yeah. Um, a lot of that has gone on. So yeah. think about it from the standpoint of you've got this gigantic trillion dollar company. You have a, a, a regulatory system that has been dismantled. I don't want to get too far down the the, the political um, you know rabbit hole, yeah, but yeah. there you know with with the Republicans in 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 power, yeah. they're they're anti regulation. Well, here's a newsflash: regulation is there to protect people from predatory business practices. Because left to their own devices, companies are going to do what they want for their bottom line, especially mm -hmm. if they have shareholders. Because let's face it, yeah. the guys who sit in the C-suite, mm -hmm. they get enormous bonuses based on how the stock performs, right? Yeah. So they have an incentive for that to perform yeah. well. Yeah. So given the choice between maybe cutting some corners and doing some some mm -hmm. less than kosher things, as we like to say, yeah. uh, in yeah. order to, to pop mm -hmm. up um, my stock yeah. by a couple bucks, yeah. which means a lot yeah. of money to me. Yeah. A, a lot of entities cannot resist that temptation. Mm. So someone needs, yeah, you know, it's just imagine a world without police, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Police are there to regulate people's, people's um, negative instincts, right? Mm -hmm. Just yeah. imagine what, the, you know, again, I'll put my screenwriter brain on. And in fact, I've even written one that's like a future utopian dystopian story uh, where there yeah. are no police and there are no locks. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's an allegory about what would that world look like? Uh, I think yeah. it would, yeah. I think it would be significantly more chaotic than it already is. And in the business world, mm. it's chaotic. Yeah. Yeah. It is. I'm just thinking about that. I mean, if you did, the only way that you could even remotely get to that point, which is completely delusional from my point of view, right, honestly, is that if there was no, there was no wealth, like there was no greed, right? You take, you take greed away because somehow there was the ability to have a true sort of socialist system, let's say, where everybody has the same in every way. And so there's no point trying to get something of somebody else. For example, well, well, yeah, but but the other the other ar the counter argument to that is, yeah, you would stifle innovation, and it, oh, and yeah. it's true, and it's yeah, it's no, absolutely yeah. true. I'm not saying that you. Let's face it, there is there is stupid regulation here in America. I mean, yeah, every time you turn around, you look at and you see and you see this kind of idiocy or or legacy stuff that's been around for decades, and it's like, why is this? law on the books like why are these regulations so i get that a lot of the regulation um 
needs to be revisited and revised for you know the modern world. Um, yeah, I, I was I was ha- you know the, the I was talking to my son in on our in our thirty five uh, hour drive, and I was saying you know the reason that the election in the United States is a Tuesday is because. Mm-hmm. Way back in the day, you couldn't you couldn't travel on Sunday because everybody went to church. So you had to travel to the polling place. And Monday was the travel day. And Tuesday was the day you voted because people were using horse and buggy. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's been it's been put into our society that Tuesday is is um, election day in November. And it's Mm -hmm. not even a holiday. I mean, that's carried on for 243 years. Maybe yeah. that needs to be revised. Maybe it should be a Saturday oh. so that people don't have to take a day off and do it. And a lot of regulation in the world operates that way. But in the tech sector, which is brandy new, right? Yeah. It's 25, maybe 30 years old. Yeah. Um, there's, there's no legacy there. This has all been created new. Yeah. Um, and some yeah. of it's good and yeah. some of it's not so good. No, completely, completely. I mean, just pulling it back to what we were, what you were particularly talking around, these monoliths and cutting out the middleman, organic reach completely makes total sense to me. I mean, I don't want to kind of put you on the spot here at all um, in terms of your depth of uh, coverage of the e-commerce world in, in particular, but have you come across any particular strategies that can be deployed by an e-commerce retailer or an omni-channel retailer or whatever to almost turn the tables and use Amazon or use Google to their benefit so that you can actually strike that balance between gaining some benefit out of these massive giants, but at the same time protecting your brand, almost trying to maximize a lead flow, for want of a better word, to your own site, for example. Um, you know, Have you come across any strategies around that at all? You know, it's a, that's a it's a very very tough one, um, yeah. especially if you're talking about, you know, white hat versus gray hat versus black hat. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are black hat ways, you know, to yeah. to do yeah. this, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I I can't I can't dignify them, you know, in a in no. a public setting. Nor nor can I no. nor can I back them as as yeah, a strategy yeah. sure. that. That you're going to have to figure out for yourself. Again, we're back yeah. to the idea of of ethics, right? What mm-hmm. kind of you know, what mm-hmm. kind of what what's your ethical compass look like as far mm-hmm. as the business goes? And I I would never recommend that anybody undertake any sort of a black hat exercise mm-hmm. in order to do that. But in the white or gray hat area, yeah, you know it's 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 tough. Once you get in in bed with these monoliths. Mm-hmm. It's very, very, very hard to get out. I mean, it, it just yeah. is. Yeah. So, you know, one piece of advice is to just never get in bed with them in the first place. Problem is, yeah. you may not live long enough <laughs> as a business. Yeah. To, to ever see any sort of end game with that, you just may not be able to no. um, to grow your business no. without. Yeah, put using Facebook ads or without yeah. doing PPC or without doing ads on Amazon. Mm. You just, mm. it just may be impossible. And then you have to ask yourself, really, the the existential or the meta question: Am I in the right business? Right, because mm. no one's holding the gun to your head and says you got to be uh, an affiliate reseller or an FBA or any kind of e-commerce site, right? I mean, there's a lot, a of, lot, a lot of ways to make money in this world as an entrepreneur, right? Mm. If you have yeah. the entrepreneurial mindset and the entrepreneurial mm. skill set, mm. then you got to ask yourself the, the fundamental question, which is why am I limiting myself mm. to working only within this virtual space? Yeah. Maybe there's some other place that yeah. I can play, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, finding a niche, obviously, in the years I've been talking to retailers at various different tech vendors myself, um, I've come across people that have been cleaning up, um, even in the face of your Amazons and and so on, because, of course, the niche that they've found um, protects them almost. So I don't know whether it's in veterinary or something like that or a vertical that doesn't really get affected by those big giants. 
um, or other other guys that I've spoken to that have managed to sort of spin off um, a kind of a, a, a side brand in a way through a giant like Amazon um, with products that are you know less uh, or more commoditized, should I say, but then using that as a bit of a vehicle to drive traffic um, in other creative ways to products that are more um, you know less commoditized and then are more difficult to get hold of and then obviously trying to capitalize that into your own domain like you mentioned a Shopify site or whatever else site you're running um, so I uh, there must be you know ways in which you can cleverly pivot if you like and make sure that you don't get burnt in these kind of stories that you talked about and and then I like the fact that you're talking about being real and saying actually you know if I'm finding myself getting exploited like that or I'm getting into trouble or I really don't think my brand is going to be building unless I get in bed with these giants that are potentially going to kind of wreck my um you know my opportunity to genuinely grow my own business and protect it then look at what you're doing and maybe there's a better way maybe there's something else um that you can do right well maybe it's just not the right business you you you, yeah. you touched on some some interesting points there first of all mm. there's an old saying there's riches in, in niches right yeah uh, and, yeah uh, or some people call it niche but then it doesn't really rhyme uh so <laughs> well, <laughs> americanized yeah there's no riches, say, riches in in that. <laughs> um so there's no question about that. There's also yeah. a lot of value in in intellectual property. Intellectual property is a you know it's yeah. a double edged sword um, yeah. because very you know if you want to patent something here in the U.S. you've got to open your kimono. Uh, you've got to you know you've got to publish how it's made, which you know Coca Cola doesn't publish doesn't patent the formula for their for yeah. their soda for a reason yeah. is because they don't want it out there so that anybody can go look it up in the patent patent office and steal it. Um, ah, right. Interesting. Now commodities in my humble opinion is a race right. to the bottom. If you're selling yeah. a commodity product, yeah. uh, just like we, you know, diapers.com, right. They're selling yeah. diapers. Yeah. It's a commodity product. Uh, yeah. having, you know, three boys, we probably went through 10,000 diapers. None of them was potty trained before the age of three. So yeah, you spend a lot of money on diapers. Um, yeah. But they're a commodity product. So if a predator yeah. decide, predatory business decides they want to sell them below cost to drive you out of business, they can. Yeah, yeah. Right? And there's not a darn thing that you can do to stop no. them. But no. if you can take a commodity product and maybe put some sort of a proprietary yes. spin on it, again, it's hard yeah. to protect. It's yeah. hard to keep people from coming in and cloning, mm. and cloning what it is you do. It's not impossible. But if you can do it and you can make the market, um, there's a great book that's called The Innovator's Dilemma that I recommended to people by a, by a MIT professor, Clay Christensen. It's a bit dated, goes back to the 90s because he talks about the, the hard drive business. Yeah. But he makes some excellent points. It's really a, worth a read because, because as much as Amazon and Apple and Microsoft are these monolithic companies and you're worried about them crushing you because you're... Yeah. You're like a flea on an elephant's butt. Yeah. But the fact that the elephant doesn't really care about the flea, sure, a, a careless whip of their tail might crush you. But for the most part, they're not really noticing you until you prove there's a market there. So yeah. if you can live down there in the in in the uh, off their radar, let's say. Yeah. They yeah. don't care. I, I know people have said to me, it's like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some business idea that comes up. It's like, why yeah. hasn't Amazon done this? It's like, yeah. because yeah. they don't care enough about it right now. Yeah. It's not yeah. registering enough, enough yeah. movement for yeah, them yeah, to yeah. put the resources towards yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. That's but if you can, yeah, if you can do that, yeah. now yeah. you have to do that with, with the end in mind, right? People right. pitch business ideas to me all the time and I'll ask them, yeah, what's yeah. your exit strategy? And they're yeah. like, Henry, yeah. it's just a business idea. It's like, yeah, but your exit strategy is going to color everything that you do. Are you going to run it till you die? Do you want to hand it to your kids? Yeah. Or do you want to yeah. do an IPO? Are you looking to flip it? Or you want to be bought by a big company? If you want to yeah. get bought by Amazon, mm -hmm. you can build a business. And plenty of people have sold their business for large amounts of money uh, yeah. to Amazon or Facebook. Um, yeah. Yeah. And they'll, they'll, they'll pay, you know, ridiculous yeah. multiples for that. 
But yeah. you got to sell. You got to be ready to sell at the right time, yeah. or they'll just clone it themselves and yeah, say, yeah. "Forget about you. We'll just clone it, take their market share." Yeah. Because yeah. what you did is you proved that mm -hmm. that market exists. Yeah. And they're Absolutely. not going to take the time to no. prove a market exists no. once you prove it, yeah. and they realize that there's money to be made. Yeah. Then you're in danger. They're either going to buy it from you or they're going to steal it from you. <laughs> Yeah, so I suppose like you say, it's completely down to the exit, and then and then your strategy. So if you are, like you say, looking to 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 drive a wedge into Amazon's world, so that they take notice of it and they can see the value, and then they buy you, fab, go and do it. So that that's in itself one strategy alongside these beasts, mm -hmm. and then the other one I love staying under the radar. Now that's clever because you know you you cleverly work out a way to do what we were talking about, you know, use them, but you stay under the radar. So you get their reach, but you don't make it so big, you know, on, on whatever niche that you're in or whatever expertise that you're, you know, bringing to the market to um, not make sure it gets too big so they don't notice. It just ticks along nicely under the back and, under, and, you know, under the radar. And then, you know, you might be running a smaller business, which works for you, whereby you can earn the revenue from that. And that's absolutely wonderful for you and your world that you're supporting um but you're not getting in any of that trouble with the with these beasts at, at the same time right well and 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 so so people don't misunderstand understand the scale we're talking about here if amazon yeah. is a trillion dollar company you know yeah i would never recommend to somebody that says that says you should collar your business you don't want it to grow too big but we may be talking about a 50 or 100 million dollar business before yeah. it ever gets the attention of yeah, one of okay. these monolithic companies, yeah, yeah. Wow. right? Yeah, you know, somebody's not going to, you know, I don't want to tell somebody, well, if your company's more than, you know, two, three million dollars, yeah. Amazon's going to crush you. Yeah. I don't think that's a worry that you have as no. as an entrepreneur. Oh, there no. are thirty million businesses in America. Mm -hmm. Only four percent of them will ever do more than a million dollars in any given year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Think yeah. about that. Most yeah. businesses in this country mm -hmm. are small businesses. Mm -hmm. They just right. are. So that, you don't have to worry about getting their attention as you grow up to be a $5 million business. No. $5 that, million dollar business for an entrepreneur. And I've had, I, I, I had my yeah. biggest business that I had that I grew organically was $4 million mm. in the 90s, mm. which would probably be close to $10 million today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a tiny business. It's mm. a great business for the entrepreneur. Yeah. You can make lots really. of money. Yeah. Um, but on the, on, the, on the scale of all businesses, it's yeah. minuscule. It's powerful. Yeah, yeah. That's great, though, because that that means in a way, because we're talking to the guys listening are running, you know, strong e-commerce brands in the UK and, and, and elsewhere and globally, you know, as well. And so I think a large contingent of those guys are going to be in that bracket of building businesses that are still tens of millions, but not yet sort of 50 to 100 mil, um, because I don't think they grow on trees particularly in the UK, because we're not that big anyway. And a, a, a number of them, you'll be able to name anyway, right? Um, so that gives yeah. plenty of bandwidth. And maybe it's not quite the monster that everybody would worry about in our space, because quite frankly, unless you're doing some pretty solid mega bucks in a way, they're not mm -hmm. going to be interested anyway. Yeah, you're, 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 you're invisible to them. Now, yeah. the, other part, the other part is that as, as giant and as monolithic as these companies are, yeah, they're still relatively tiny compared to the fact that there are seven and a half billion people on this planet. And there yeah. are enormous markets out there where they have not penetrated. Again, these businesses are not that old. Uh, yeah. Apple back in the 90s. I know I started my first business. I was an Apple valuated reseller. I sold Macintosh yeah. computers back in the 90s. Apple yeah. stock went down to about two bucks. Yeah. Um, they were on the cusp of bankruptcy oh, completely. Uh, before before Steve Jobs came back in yeah, in yeah. the mid nineties. Yeah. So so they um, they've grown this up over twenty five years. Amazon mm. is the same thing. Mm. They only started selling mm. things other than books mm. uh, in the early two thousands. Mm. They have an enormous runway, and they have there there's enormous penetration that they haven't even reached. You oh, yeah. as a nimble yeah. player, you know they're yeah. the Titanic. Yeah. You're a little speedboat. Yeah. Um, there are market niches mm. that you can exploit. Now you got to go find them, especially yeah. within your niche. Yeah. 
yeah. where you can reach people directly mm. um, and they'll buy from you directly as opposed to going through the, the large mm. entities because yeah. the large entities are just not servicing them. No, no, absolutely. Right? So listen, Henry, right? Obviously, you, you, it's part of your, your career, if you like, the, the, the services you provide business leaders. Um, what sort, I mean, in a nutshell, what kinds of things, because you mentioned at the very beginning when we were chatting before we came on, on, on air, that pretty much you help any business because the, the practices, um, the statutes, if you like, are very similar across the whole kind of board. So could you tell guys a little bit about what you generally coach on? Sure. So, so um, there are two kinds of coaches mm. out there. And I've mentioned this on previous podcasts, but uh, but I'll uh, I'll repeat myself. I'll keep it concise. Uh, there are there are those that sell a system. Yeah. And there's a lot of them. There's EOS. There's uh, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Rockefeller Habits. Right. I've I've read a lot of these books. Um, yeah. And it's it's sort of like here's our system. And there are coaches out there who sell these systems, yeah. and they're wonderful. They've got great great stuff, and I've read all of them, and they've got wonderful wonderful nuggets in there. But it's a system. Yeah. Right. I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum where it's totally custom. Right. right. I'm not yeah. giving you a system and saying, follow this and the world will be your oyster. Um, yeah. Because in my experience, there's a few things that I've discovered. Number one, it's yeah. really hard to follow a system. Your brain has to work pretty much exactly like that system. And if it does, you'll probably knock it out of the park because the systems are all great. It's like the exercise videos, right? Every one of those exercise videos, if you followed them religiously, you'd get in shape, right? The one thing they can't do is, is it gets you to stop eating potato chips and sitting on the couch and watching the telly all day, right? That they can't help you with, right? But assuming you can get past, past that point, the systems are great. They give you a framework, just do the exercise for an hour, three days a week, you'll get in shape, yeah. right? I'm the other way. My, yeah. I believe my, my core talent, my... My skill set is my ability to understand people, understand their patterns, find their blind spots, understand yeah. what they're really good at, yeah. um, where their weaknesses are. Mm -hmm. So that's what I do, what I call totally bespoke coaching. Um, yeah. So yeah. that's it. Now, I am writing a book. It has the unlikely title called oh. Codfish. And mm -hmm. Codfish stands for Customer Support, Operations, Development, Finance, infrastructure, sales and marketing, and human yeah. resources. I call those the seven silos that every business, whether you're Amazon or a solopreneur, every business has these seven areas that they have to deal with. There's not and six I, and there's not and eight. There's seven. You've trademarked, right? You've trademarked that, I assume. I haven't trademarked. Maybe now we're back to the trademark. So, okay, I got to add to my list. I got a trademark. FQ and I got a yeah. trademark. I'm going to make the uh, trademark lawyers yeah. rich. Um, uh, yeah. Yes, but I haven't trademarked that, but I, but I will. It's the only word in the English language that actually fits the <laughs> seven languages, seven yeah. letters. Um, so I'm writing this and I'm writing it sort of piecemeal and I'm putting it out little bits yeah. that I write on um, on LinkedIn and on Facebook and stuff. Fantastic. Like that. So um, so that's a framework, which is the idea that yeah. okay, you've got these seven silos. Uh -huh. And and you're, there's an origin story to how your business started. My first business uh -huh. came out of the customer support, very very likely place for for them uh -huh. uh, to come out of. Yeah. You as the entrepreneur, if you look at those those seven silos, uh -huh. I, I've asked people, tell me which ones you're really good at, uh -huh. and tell me which ones you suck at. And generally speaking, there'll be two that people will say that they're really good at. And there's three that are in the middle that they're okay at. And there's two that they really, they really are their Achilles heel. Mm. Right. Mm. And then we look at how we can mm. maximize um, your proficiency as an entrepreneur in mm. these areas. You, you may never, you know, the, the number one deficiency that I see with people is finance yeah. They just they just don't yeah. know their numbers. No. I talked about this recently with someone how mm. they run their their business out of the bank account. And if the bank account has money in it, that means they must be making money. They've never heard of accounts payable or accounts receivable. Sometimes it's a it's a little it's a little um, I have to mm -hmm. I don't want to be too judgmental, 
but yeah. I just kind of shake my head a little and say, that's not best practices for how that's very, very common. Yeah. Are you ever going to be great at finance? Maybe not. But are there people out there who are great at finance that you can hire even yeah. fractionally to, yeah. to, to shore up this part yeah. of your business? You're yeah. damn right. They are every one of those seven silos. There are people out there that there are scores of people that you can hire who kick butt Absolutely. in all of those areas. And it's massive. You need important. to find them. You need to bring them in. Yeah. Whether you hire them as consultants or hire them full time. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. You need to do that. To, again, we're back to the concept of balance because all of these need to work in concert. If you're spending yeah. all your money on sales and marketing, yeah. but your operations are awful and you can't fulfill all the wonderful sales that you're organically out there to get, you're out of balance yeah. and you can't run this business this way. So my Absolutely. job is to raise your awareness mm. and bring all these things to the fore mm-hmm. And I do it. I'm a little bit of a teacher. I'm a little bit of a coach. I'm a little bit of a cheerleader, right? I got to tell you when you got big wins. Sometimes I got to pick you up when you, when you get, you know, kicked in the head by, you know, a big client hiring you like has happened to some of my clients. Like I've had clients, you've had million dollar clients one day just fire them. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a tough one. It is. It is. It is. Well, um, this has been absolutely fascinating, Henry. I know we could talk for hours and, and I sure. hope we, we get another chance. Right. Um, but uh, you want. no, thank you. And, and just to sort of finish off, what, what's the, uh, you mentioned about um, the coaching and codfish and all the great stuff that you're doing. What, what's the best way for these guys to get hold of you, to, to talk to you a bit more about that and get access to some of these resources and have a chat to you about, uh, you know, their leadership and their strategies and so on. Well, I have I have two sites. Uh, actually, I have three sites, but I have a site that's just Henry Das. Right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have Henry Das H E N R Y D A A S dot com, yeah. Yeah. which is kind of my vanity site. It's like an aggregation that has all my my yeah. business stuff and my pers- also my screenplays, my personal stuff on it. But my main my main business um, uh, website is called Das Knowledge D A A S Knowledge dot com. Yeah. Uh, I even have D-A-S-S uh, um, because people misspell my name. So I have the other yeah, well, the other URLs pointing to it. Um, if you click the little button that says get my help, you can sign up for a free strategy session. I'm happy to talk with people. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. But yeah. the time it takes, um, I'm very generous with my time. I like to help people. It's kind of why I got into the coaching game. Yeah, um, well, because as I've said many times before, uh, yeah. trading time for money is one way to make money. It's it's not the best way to make money, <laughs> right? Yeah. I know because I've had other ways to do it, but I love doing it. <laughs> yeah. um, it allows me to be location independent. It allows me to work with a lot of different people. Uh, I, I created this business on purpose. It wasn't yeah. an accidental business. Yeah. Uh, and I do it because I love it. Yeah. No, it is. It's, a, it's a, such a wonderful reward. In, in passing on the expertise, isn't there? With, uh, with oh, exactly no question. Coming. Yeah, amazing. Well, um, as, I get, as I say, I mean, it's fantastic talking to you. Um, and uh, I really think this has capped off the second series, guys, um, fantastically. I hope you've really enjoyed um, listening. Um, Henry, I do hope you get back, okay, back to uh, New Jersey. <sighs> Uh, yeah, I have a flight tomorrow night. Yeah. I'm waiting for the results of my, yeah. my COVID test. That's so it. That's I may, uh, I may end up staying in this hotel room for the weekend. And uh, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, let's really hope not. I, I hope you get back and hope the test is, uh, is negative. Yeah. All right. My dad but, uh, used to say, may you live in interesting times. It's like, this is a little too interesting. I gotta yeah. be honest. I know for real, for real. I was just saying earlier, I still can't get used to wearing a black, um, <laughs> getting a loaf of bread and the woman looking at me just a little bit like are you going to try and like take the money out the till or or what <laughs> you know what I mean my, my face mask is an old dishcloth oh, that, my wife, that my wife sewed into a, a face mask no it way has, I should probably send you a picture it has owls on it they right? do it's yeah, you very, send it. very non-confrontational yeah um, it's a very good idea very user idea. friendly very user friendly mask and yeah. fishing software that that's out there and all the talks of China and their facial rec. I may, yeah. I may never yeah. stop wearing a mask. 
<laughs> I'm kidding. I'll tell you, you've got to send me, send me a picture, right? Send me a picture, right? I'll put it on LinkedIn. I will, I will, I will take a picture of my, my owl. All right. All right. Well, uh, well, it just remains for you to say thank you so much, Henry, and thank you for listening, everybody. And uh, if you've not done so already, do register um, for these podcasts. As you know, there's uh, plenty of them coming out, uh, particularly with Series 3 coming out as well. And obviously, Henry's will be there as well. Uh, and that's at segmentify.com forward slash podcast. And uh, as always, you know, please leave a review, give us some feedback, or follow, follow us on Spotify or whatever channels you, you prefer. And if you have any particular questions for Henry, for me, for any of the, the guys that you listen to, or you want to be involved, uh, or you have any topics you want me to go and actually research and talk about, uh, do email me anytime at phil at segmentify.com. But uh, once again, Henry, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a great pleasure. Awesome. Yeah, and uh, we look forward to uh, speaking to you all again soon. Put us to the test and let us prove we can drive more revenue for you. Sign up for a completely free proof of concept or split test against your current provider. Set up and optimized by our team within a few days at segmentify.com slash demo.